Thank you all very much. Um, first, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers of this World Congress, uh, Ignacio and his team, Paloma, um, and all the team have done just a remarkable job in pulling this Congress together. I am proud to stand with them at this World Congress. It's among the best that the World Congress of Families has ever put on, so congratulations. I uh, most especially appreciate the very hip music that you played a minute ago for us. Um, we were dancing. I don't know if you noticed. For many years, those of us in the UN pro-life and pro-family movement have focused on the documents under negotiation, and you might say that we have missed the forest for the trees. This is an American expression that means that we have focused on details and perhaps have missed the larger picture. It is true we have been successful in stopping abortion from becoming an international human right, and we have largely stopped the homosexual movement. As large as these issues are, there are still larger issues at the UN that we have almost missed. What I will describe to you in this talk is the larger picture, which is that the UN radicals, in alliance with radical lawyers and judges and other actors activists and advocates around the world are attempting the greatest power grab the world has ever known. They seek to decide for all mankind the most intimate details of people's lives, and they are determined to do this from their lofty and elite perches at the United Nations in New York, the European Union in Brussels, and other centers of international power. In order to achieve this, they must also remake the international system, where once international relations meant relations between and among states, it now means international bodies interfering with the personal lives of individuals, where once sovereign states determined what was best for people within their borders, the transnational progressives, their own term, seek to usurp this power from the states and from the people. What we face is a tsunami change in social policy and in the international system. The result of this is a monumental democratic deficit. Ask yourself, who is your representative to the United Nations? The fact that none of you can do this points up this huge democratic deficit because it is these people who have taken it upon themselves to direct your intimate lives. This is the big picture and it strikes at all families all over the world. And it strikes at all countries too, north and south, east and west, rich and poor. We are all in this fight together. The pro-life and pro-family coalition at the UN began our work during the preparatory phase of the Cairo Conference on Population and Development in 1994. Our opponents began at that time to advance an international right to abortion in UN documents. At first, they tried to get an explicit right to abortion. They were defeated at Cairo and at subsequent UN conferences by a coalition of Christians and Muslims that was created by John Paul the Great. Because this great alliance defeated radical efforts to make abortion a universal right, they began an extended effort to advance their agenda, their agenda through lying and trickery. They created code words, such as reproductive health. From the time of Cairo to this very day, they have successfully placed reproductive health or reproductive rights into countless UN documents. The most important thing to know about this phrase is that it has never been defined by governments in any binding document as including a right to abortion. Our sophistication on these questions have grown significantly since those days. Over the years, we have come to know their intentions in adding this phrase to non-binding UN documents, and this is what we call the soft law strategy. Soft law refers to efforts by international radicals to advance an idea known as customary international law. Customary international law is law that is not necessarily written down but that is understood over time to bind states nonetheless. This is achieved through long-standing universal state practice with the understanding of legal obligation. In order for customary law to emerge, three things must be present. 
There must be universal state practice. This means that all countries must practice whatever it is. Second, this practice must have gone on for a long time. It cannot happen overnight or even over decades. Third, states must practice it based on their understanding that they have a legal obligation to do so. This is a very high bar and explains why there are so few items considered as customary international law. One of them is safe passage of diplomats. Another is piracy. Proponents of abortion make the case that if the phrase reproductive health is repeated enough times in non-binding UN documents, then a customary international law on abortion has been achieved. Let me make clear that this is false, and our opponents know that it's false. Customary international law cannot be established from non-binding documents, and neither can it be established in only 15 years. It takes decades and even centuries. They have not been successful in any courts of law or parliaments with their arguments from customary international law, which brings us to what has become a more successful strategy that we call the hard law strategy. The second thing we notice over time is the aggressive pro-abortion nature of the deliberations of various UN committees charged with monitoring compliance with hard law human rights treaties. All hard law treaties have committees before which governments must appear periodically to report on how they are implementing the treaty. Many years ago, we began monitoring the committee charged with monitoring the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW. What we noticed was the committee was telling governments that they had to change their laws on abortion. It should be noted that this committee has no authority to make governments do anything. It should also be noticed, noted that the CEDAW Treaty doesn't even mention abortion. It doesn't even mention the code word that is used to mean abortion, reproductive health. Still, over the years, we have counted that the committee has directed more than 90 countries to change their laws on abortion. How can they do this, and what is their purpose? The CEDAW committee is made up of 22 individuals who are nominated and voted upon by states' parties to the CEDAW treaty. They do not represent governments when they are on the committee. Once they are elected, they are beholden to no one but themselves. These 22 come from mostly left-wing groups who are also abortion advocates. What we have here is the specter of sovereign states having to report to individuals, most of them hard-left advocates for abortion. Besides berating governments, this group of individuals, this group of private citizens, has taken it upon themselves to rewrite the treaties they review. Let's linger for a moment on that. CEDAW is a hard law treaty. It is legally binding on states that ratify it. Sovereign states work sometimes for years to negotiate such treaties. These states generally have to take these treaties before their parliaments to gain ratification. This is a long and laborious and largely democratic process. In the end, hard -fought treaty, these hard-fought treaties bind states legally. Yet with this committee, there is a group of ideologically driven private citizens who have taken it upon themselves to rewrite hard law treaties and then try to enforce this reinterpretation on the sovereign states that negotiated the treaty in the first place. Here is specifically what the CEDAW committee has done. The CEDAW treaty is silent on abortion. It does not even mention it. It does not even mention reproductive health. But in something called General Recommendation 24, the CEDAW committee of private citizens has read abortion into the document and now routinely tells governments they must change their laws on abortion. This strikes right at the heart of the democratic process. The citizens of sovereign states are generally content that their governments can and do represent their wishes and their best interests. This citizen 
allows his government to negotiate treaties that are then binding on the state and sometimes upon the citizen. This citizen at least has a chance to affect the policies of his own government. But how does this citizen have any effect, have any chance to affect the processes of the CEDAW Committee, a largely unknown group of private citizens answering to no one but themselves? This is a profound democratic deficit. What of the effect of these rulings by the CEDAW Committee? Does anyone listen? Do their rulings have any effect on the law? Yes, they do. They certainly do. In recent months, the High Court of Columbia has overturned their country's laws on abortion and in the process cited what they considered to be treaty obligations under CEDAW. Judges of the Mexican Supreme Court have determined the same thing, that there are treaty obligations under CEDAW to overturn laws against abortion. And all of this is a lie. This argument is now on the march across the globe, and it does not come just from the CEDAW Treaty, but from the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, where the Right to Life Clause is now interpreted by radical lawyers as including a right to abortion. It is not just the cause of the unborn that is threatened by these radical reinterpretations of hard law treaties. Radical homosexual groups, along with UN representatives, now interpret international treaties as including sexual orientation and gender identity as categories of non-discrimination, just like sex, race, religion, national origin, and other well-established categories. UN committees will soon begin directing states to mandate homosexual marriage, homosexual adoption, and the teaching of homosexual propaganda to little children. One must not think these outrageous maneuvers affect only countries in the developing world. It is happening in the developed world, too. In fact, it is happening in the United States. A few years ago, the United States Supreme Court made homosexual sodomy a constitutional right. In doing so, the Supreme Court referred to so-called new international norms and to rulings of the European Court of Human Rights. When the U.S. Supreme Court overturned the death penalty for those whose crimes were committed as juveniles, the court cited the Convention on the Rights of the Child, a treaty that the United States has never even ratified. When the Supreme Court, this is, this is hard law strategy of the hard left, in fact is and will affect every country in the world. What we are talking about is something called global governance. Through the use of soft law and hard law, there is a lattice of newly claimed norms that are being forced upon governments and upon the people. These norms, these new norms, have never been officially decided or voted upon, they are reached through treachery, lies, deceit, and raw power. Those doing this do not believe in the democratic process. They believe in their own superiority. They believe they know better than democratic elected officials. And they certainly know better than mothers and fathers and other citizens around the world. The big picture is that they are moving on many fronts. They are moving on the UN front through the drafting of documents, hard and soft and then through the interpretation of these documents. They are moving through the court system around the world and imposing legal changes based on these reinterpretations of hard law treaties and non-binding resolutions. Why does this matter? This war is being waged against three sacred sovereignties. The sovereignty of the nation, the sovereignty of God and his church, and the sovereignty of the family. We will stand before the judgment seat of God alone as, individu as individuals. But on this earth, he provides for us certain institutions whose nearly sole purpose is to teach us his law. These mediating institutions, the nation, the church, and the family, are really our sole teachers. If any one of them goes wrong, we may be lost. If each of them goes wrong, we will be utterly lost. Our opponents insist that each of these institutions must change. They must become different than how God made them. And in this change, they will be destroyed. 
And these are the stakes. They cannot get any higher. The good news is that God called us to this dangerous time and this place for a purpose, and it was not for a life of ease. He called us into this time and this place, which is a time of great tumult. He called us into this time and this place to defend His creation from those who would sully it. Some may long for a life of ease and comfort, and this is not what God had in mind for you or for me. There is no finer time to be alive than right now, for there never has been a time when good men and women are so very needed. The promise of this Congress and others like it, this is your promise and my promise. We will defend the church. We will defend our families. We will defend our countries. We will meet the radicals in the courts. We will meet them in the parliaments. We will meet them in the universities and the high schools and the grade schools and the public square. Wherever they are, we will also be there. And we will never give up. We will never give in. We will never surrender. And I say this to our opponents who are in this room right now. We will never give up. Thank you.